Well, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. This is Ned from Caspio. Welcome to another episode of Caspio Live. Uh, before I begin, you guys know the drill. Before I begin today's stream, let me know if you can hear me okay. And we will go ahead and jump into our class today. Uh, for those of you who are here, welcome. Nice to see a few of you. Hey, Phil. I know David's here as well. King Capo. Hey, hey. Nice to see you. Hey, Brian. It's good to be back, you know, I, it feels right after being away for two months. Uh, as you guys know, I was on my pat leave. And um, funny story, I told my friend, you know, before my pat leave, I don't know if I mentioned this in a previous live stream, but I said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go on my two month vacation. That's what I said. I called it a vacation. <laughs> and then my, my, my friend said, you're going to learn. Uh, that's no vacation. You're going to learn and you're going to learn quick. And boy, did I learn. Yeah. Uh, that that was not easy, let me tell you. The first couple of weeks, uh, for those of you who have kids, you can probably relate. Um, it's really just a lot of maintenance in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. He said you're going to learn, and yeah, I did learn the hard way because, uh, yeah, like I said, it's a lot of maintenance. Um, you hardly get any sleep. Uh, I think we have a routine going now, so it's a little bit easier, but in the beginning... Uh, because it wasn't the delivery wasn't that smooth. Let's just put it that way. Um, my wife had to stay in bed for a couple of weeks, and I did a lot of the um, heavy lifting when it comes to cooking, cleaning, making sure she's okay, also taking care of the baby. So it was it was a lot to take on. But you know, we have a two story house. At least I feel like I'm in better shape because of it. Going up and down the stairs a million times. <laughs> the baby's name is Luca. L U K A. Uh, not yeah. Maybe I didn't mention that, but yeah, it's Luca. Not like the Disney movie, the animated Disney movie. It has nothing to do with that name. It also has nothing to do with Luca Doncic from the NBA. It's just a very common uh, name where I'm from originally, and it translates here well in the U.S. Um, so we decided to go with that name. Um, sleep is for the week. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, have kids, they said, you know, it'll be fun, they said. And it is for the most part. <laughs> Cause I know I sound, like I sound like I'm complaining, but, um, you know, it's, it's just a lot of work. But when they crack that smile, you know, it's worth it. You know, it really is. I'm not going to lie. Um, but all in all, very blessed, very happy. Uh, things are going well. Although we did have a problem in the beginning because as a new parent, you have no idea what you're doing initially when you get home. Um, and the baby wasn't latching correctly, so we thought we were feeding the baby, but as it turned out, we weren't. The baby was only eating a little bit of milk, and it reached to the point where it became almost borderline severe jaundice. Uh, we had to get a consultant to come in, and she said, you got to feed this baby immediately. So we had a, we had like a straw or a wire coming down into the mouth, and we flooded him with milk, and we had to bottle feed the baby, and we were still bottle feeding the baby for, um, for about two months now. But he's doing, he's doing good. Uh, he's regained all of his weight. Uh, he weighs almost 12 pounds now. Uh, and he doesn't look yellow anymore. So we were naturally, we were concerned as new parents. Um, but luckily, thankfully, everything is okay now. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, I digress. Let's get into our live, live stream. I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience. I'm very excited to be a dad. Uh, I think we, we both feel that he's a good mix of both of us, you know, looks-wise. Personality-wise, we'll see. Uh, right now, he just likes to look around, observe the space around him, and um, typical baby stuff, he'll cry when he's hungry, or if he's overfed, uh, he won't be too happy about that. And if he's overtired, he'll cry, and then, yeah, that's really it. And again, like I said, for those of you who are parents, I'm sure you can relate to everything that I'm saying at this point. But he's cute. And one day, he'll make his cameo appearance here in the live stream. I'll bring him in uh, so you can see what it looks like um, once maybe he's a little bit older. We'll see. All right. Uh, let me know if anybody has any questions before I begin. As the title stated, uh, we are going to create a ticket management system today. Uh, it's a very simple ticket management system where we have uh, two user types. We have customers that can log in. So I can show you a live example. As a customer, when you log in, you can manage all of your tickets. You can see which ones are 
open and closed, I can submit a new ticket uh, based on the categories that I provided. Once I submit that ticket, I should be able to see that listed here in my results page. And then on the flip side, when we log in as the employee, we can assign tickets to ourselves and we can also go to ticket details and we can respond to tickets that the customer submits. Um, once again, uh, just a lot of you know that in these training classes, we don't focus on the aesthetics, the look and feel. It's mainly about the functionality because we only get one hour for these live streams. So I try to put together the, uh, the structure of the application and the, and the flow. Uh, can I make this application look a lot nicer? Yes, I can uh, for the front end, but you know we just have to focus on the functionality. Um, but if you guys like this application, as you know, I always make it available as a download in the description of the YouTube video later on. So you can download the app, you can import it into your account, you can use it as is, or you can customize it um, to your own needs and your own business requirements. Okay, so employees and customers can log in, we can add a new ticket, and we can communicate with the employee, and then eventually the employee can close that ticket if the resolution was found. Okay. Yeah, he is getting healthier. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you positive energy and thoughts. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're all doing really, really well, <laughs> except for a couple of close calls with the blowouts. I'm sure <laughs> you guys know what, what I mean by that. Um, okay, so let's begin and let's see how we can develop this. Uh, to save on time, um, let me open up my container. As always, I have my tables created. Uh, I'll go through each table so that you can see the structure and how I've added my fields and data types. I've also completed my authentications. Many of you know how to do that just to save on time. And the main focus of the live stream will be how to create forms and reports and how to connect everything together inside our web pages. Okay, so for my first table, let's take a look at my customer table. All of your typical fields, we have the customer ID, we have first name, last name, full name. Uh, for those of you who are new to Caspio, if you have names in your table, I recommend that you have three different fields, one for first name, last name, and then you concatenate the first and last name together as a full name using a formula data type, which is listed right over here, formula. And then to combine the first and last name, you're simply going to include your first and last name as a parameter using this dropdown. And then you, can, um, you create the space by adding a little bit of syntax. You'll do plus space one plus, and that's going to create the space between your first and last name in your table. We have the email that's going to be a unique field. We have our password field and we have date created. And I have a sample user listed inside my customer table. Then we have the employee table, which looks exactly the same. Uh, once again, we have the primary key. We have our name fields, email, password, and date created. And I also have a sample user listed here as well. One thing you'll notice is I opted out now to have a status field, which is usually used to make employees active or inactive, giving permissions who can log in and who cannot log in. Again, to save on time, I decided not to add that field in my table so that we can avoid building the view. The view is used to filter out users from the table based on the field. So if you wanted to only list out active employees, you would build the view based on that checkbox to only filter out active employees and then you can use the view in the authentication object. I built my authentications directly on top of my tables and you'll see in just a moment. Okay, so the main table that we have in this application is the tickets table. Hey Ali, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So here we have the ticket ID, which is the primary key. Uh, we have to know which customer opened up the ticket. So we stamp the customer's ID. We want to know which employee is handling that ticket, so we need to stamp the employee ID. And then we have category, ticket title, description, attachment, status, and date created. All of your uh, common fields that you will see in the ticket table. I have a couple of lookup tables, so we have categories. So the categories, these are my categories. These are arbitrary categories. You're going to have your own for your own business needs, but I have website, portal, workflow, and email, more on the tech side. For example, if a customer is unable to log into their account, they can simply say 
category portal and they can provide a description saying I wasn't able to log in. We have the status, which is here. So this will show me uh, if the ticket status is open or closed. Very simple. And responses. So let's take a look at the design here. Under responses, you're going to be able to see the primary key. Uh, we need to know which responses are tied to what ticket. So that's a one to many. One ticket ha could have many responses. So we need to stamp the ticket ID in the responses table. The user ID is going to stamp either the customer ID or the employee ID because we need to know who is responding to these tickets. Okay. We have the response itself attachment and date submitted. So those are the tables that we have for this application. Then we have two authentications built for customers to log in and the employees to log in. So if you look at here under edit, I chose my table customers. I'm using the standard table or view. You may have noticed a change in your account. We now have directories as well. If you guys would like, I can go into this a little bit later in today's live stream. I can spend about five or 10 minutes explaining what directories do. I can highlight the pros and cons to it. Um, and then if you have any additional questions on directories, I'm happy to give you the answers on that as well. Um, it's a fairly new feature. It's a enterprise grade user management access system that allows um, on the directories. Yeah, we can spend a little bit more time uh, later on in today's live stream, but think of it like um, a built in IDP identity provider, like Microsoft Active Directory, Okta now built into Caspio and you can manage all of your users within the directory all in one place. And there are a lot of security features around the directory, such as two factor authentication on the app side, uh, a lot of security on the password. I'll go into it a little bit later. I don't want to deviate uh, too far from the main topic, but we'll get into it after afterwards, okay? And uh, so I'm using my standard table here, email and password, those are my login fields. Let's cancel out of that. And my employee authentication is built exactly the same. We have our employee table, email and password, all of that good stuff. And now let's get into building data pages. And what I'll do is I'll go back and forth between my live examples so that you know exactly what we're creating at every single point. So as a customer, I would like to be able to submit a new ticket. So let's build that data page. So we'll select submission form. We'll hit next. We'll select our tickets table. And let's give this a name, uh, create a ticket. And we'll just go with our blue style and English localization and restrict access to our customer login, right? Because customers need to sign in and only then they have access to the submission form. We'll hit next. All right, so what fields do we need on this form? So we're going to need the customer ID. So we need to know which customer is submitting the form. Uh, we want the category, ticket title, description, attachment, status, and they created. I'm going to hit next. So for customer ID, we simply need to hide that field. Okay, we're going to use the authentication field to stamp the customer ID. The user doesn't need to see that field when they log in. It's a hidden field. But upon submission, we're going to stamp the customer ID into the tickets table. This is how we know which customer submitted the ticket. For category, we're going to turn this into a dropdown. And then we're going to do both lookup table and custom values. So under custom values, we're going to say select category, and this could be a required field. Make sure you delete the value. You're not really submitting that into a table. And then your lookup table is simply going to be the one that's listing all of the categories. And you can leave that the way it is. Take a title, most likely going to be a required field. Description is going to be a text area. You could also make that a required field if you'd like. Attachment can be an optional field. For status, we're also going to hide that field. And by default, we're going to assign this to be a open ticket. Because it was just submitted, so therefore it needs to be flagged as an open ticket. Okay, you can't submit something that's closed. I think the employee needs to close that ticket eventually. And then date created, we're going to turn this into a simple timestamp. And hit finish to save. Okay, so... I already have my HTML files in Notepad++. For those of you who have attended my previous live streams, I work directly inside the code inside HTML. 
Uh, that's how I create my web pages. I download templates off the internet and I simply modify my templates. But if you're using any CMS out there, you know, Webflow, uh, WordPress, GoDaddy, um, Weebly, Caspio is compatible with all of these website builders and you don't have to worry about the code. You can just simply copy and paste uh, wherever you want to position that data page. So for me, I have a page called New Ticket. That's my web page. And this is where I'm going to put my Caspio deploy code. So I just need to hit deploy. Enable deployment status, grab my deploy code, copy it, go back to my HTML document, and simply just paste and save. So now I saved it locally. I need to make this web page available on the internet as well. So I use WinSCP to accomplish that. So let me close that. I'll need to probably log in. I should have logged in ahead of time. I did not. So let's do that. Okay. So these are my local files that I have on my desktop and this is hosted inside some app some app domain is owned by Caspio we purchased that domain a long time ago for our employees to do testing so what I need to do is find the folder so that's the folder that's going to, that contains all of my web pages and I just need to move this folder to some app by dragging and dropping it's just going to take a second here to move all the files just bear with it for a second and then we can open it up. So sumapp.com, NP, uh, let's see, uh, ticket management system, live, dist, and the page is called, what's the name of the page? Add ticket, uh, new ticket.html. New underscore ticket.html. Okay, so let me log in as my customer who happens to be Sarah Smith, I believe. If not, we'll come back. Okay, there we go. And there's my form embedded. Does it look like my live example? Let's have a look. Yeah, it has all the same fields. We have category, ticket title, description, and attachment. The only thing that's missing is the heading, which you can add at any point, either on your web page or inside a Caspio data page by using an HTML block or a header and footer. Okay, so let's make a submission. Why don't we do that? Let's go ahead and select category email, ticket title, um, my Outlook isn't responding. Can someone take a look? And if you have an attachment, you can attach the file. We're going to hit submit. Once I go to all tickets, you will see it's an empty page. So I need to build my next data page in order for the uh, customer to be able to view their submitted tickets. So back to my live example, we need to create this data page. So let's go back to Caspio and let's create a brand new data page. So let's do reports. Um, I used a tabular format report. Let's do the same thing today. We're going to hit next. And for those of you who are new at Caspio, if you've never used Caspio, let me ask you a question. Let's make this more fun and engaging. For those of you who, who know the answer, I, I hope that you'll just stay back and don't provide the answer. But what table do you think I need to select here uh, for our next data page? Based on what I just mentioned, if the customer logs in and they submit the ticket using that form, the data page, I now need to be able to see my submissions. So what table do you think I need to select? And if I don't get an answer within like 10 or 15 seconds, I'll just provide the answer myself. Just curious to know what table you would select here in order to view all the submissions. And if you don't know, that's okay. And you also don't need to be shy. Okay, so the right answer is the tickets table. Yeah, that's correct. Tickets table. So let's give it a name. We're going to call this My Tickets, okay, which pertains to the customer's tickets. We're going to do blue style. We're going to do localization English. Enforce authentication using the customer login. We're going to hit next. And I would like to have a search form. Let's have the results appear underneath the search form and display the results on the initial load. And I want to restrict access using RLS, customer ID to customer ID. When you enforce RLS on that data page and a customer logs in, they're only going to be able to see the tickets that belong to their customer ID. I don't need the customers to see other customers' tickets, okay, for security. And then 
me selecting results appear underneath the search form and display the results on the initial load. What that means is when you load the page, not only do you see the search form, but you also see the results directly underneath the search form. Okay, for those of you who are new to Caspio, if I chose to keep this unchecked and then I load the page, the only thing you're going to see is the search form. And then you have to click search in order to see the results. Okay, so let's make sure this is selected. All right, let's hit next. Okay, so what search fields do we want to include? I'm just going to borrow the ones that I already have. We have ticket number, we have ticket title, and status. So we have ticket number, ticket status. Uh, let's do ticket title first and then ticket status. Okay, hit next. So for ticket ID, um, I really should have called this ticket number instead, like this. Um, maybe I can go back to my table later on and change that because it makes more sense to me instead of ticket. You can call it ticket ID, but I, it's more common to see ticket number instead. So let's just do simple contains. Uh, ticket title will be contains as well. And then for status, we can have a drop down and we want to be able to search any status, okay, which will return all the open ones and all the closed tickets. And I also would like to be able to do both for lookup table, which we're going to simply link to our status lookup table. So now in my drop down, you're going to be able to see that as the first option. But underneath that, we're going to be able to see open and closed. So if I want to filter my tickets based on closed or open, I can do so by selecting from the drop down. And then the last thing I would like to put all of my fields in the same row. So what I'll do is select my ticket ID field, go to the advanced tab and say continue next element on the same line, put my label on top of the field. Same thing with ticket title, continue next element on the same line, label on top of the field. And for status, we're going to put the label on top. If I had another field underneath the status field, then I will be able to say continue next element on the same line. Okay, but I only have three fields. Moving on, let's see on the results page, we have also ticket number, date created, ticket title, category status, and assigned to. So we have ticket ID, we have ticket title. Oh, I could also include category. I'm not going to do that. Date created. All right. We have, well, let's include category, actually. I take that back. Status. So we have category, we have status, and we have employee ID. So then we know which employee is handling that request from the results page. Uh, let's see, do I have any inline edit? I don't. Uh, I also don't have the ability to delete my previous tickets. Uh, okay, so we'll keep it as is. We're not going to have any editing capability. Let's continue. And then for the results page, what I need to include is an HTML block. And inside that HTML block, I always like to position it at the very bottom of my list. We're going to go ahead and disable the HTML editor. And I need to include a web page that's going to contain my ticket details, my response form, and all of my previous responses. So in my live example, you will see that it's taking me to a page called ticket underscore details dot HTML. And in the process, when I click on that link, it's going to pass the ticket ID to the subsequent page. So when I click on that link, you will see how in the URL I'm passing the ticket ID that belongs to this specific ticket. And here we have the ticket details, we have the form to submit the response, and we have the responses as well. So what we need to do here is write a very simple hyperlink. Okay, hopefully everyone knows how to write a basic HTML hyperlink. If you don't know how to do that, you can enable the HTML editor, give your link a name, we're going to call this ticket details, highlight the text like that, and then click on the link button that you see over here and then provide the destination URL. So ticket underscore details dot HTML. And then what you need to do is pass the, uh, the ticket ID to the next page. So you add the question mark to initiate the protocol. You give your parameter a name. We're going to call this TID, which to me stands for ticket ID. So when you're naming your parameters, um, you could write it out as ticket ID if you'd like. That could be your parameter name. But it's much easier on the eyes if you just abbreviate that, which is TID, which stands for ticket ID. You add your equal sign, and then you're going to insert the field that you wish to pass. And in this case, it's going to be a ticket ID. Okay, you click OK, and you hit OK. And now it becomes a clickable link. 
So when the end user clicks on that link, it's going to take them to that web page. And at the same time, we're going to pass the ticket ID. And we need to pass that ticket ID because all three of these data pages that you see on this page are receiving that ticket ID. That's how the application knows who to filter out the details for, for what ticket. We have a hidden field here that's submitting the ticket ID. And then we have the responses that are being filtered based on the ticket ID. And this ticket ID that we passed is being received across all three of these data pages. Yeah, so thank you for that. That is correct. So for example, what you're going to see now when I click save, well, let's hit next. I need to continue here. And we're going to simply just say 25 tickets is fine. Let's have 25 tickets on the results page and let's uh, sort our tickets based on the latest first. Hit next and then let's disable the details page because we're going we're gonna to create our own custom details page and hit finish. So now we're going to deploy that data page, grab our embed code, and let's come over here to our page called all tickets. We're going to replace that. Paste, save. Let's go to WinSCP. And now inside this folder, I just need to find TMS Live that's on some app. TMS Live, distribution, distribution. And then we have all tickets, which we just saved offline. We're going to move that to some app to replace the one that we now have. Okay, so we're going to replace it. And now when we refresh the page, you're going to be able to see that data page, which has the one that we just created, which my Outlook isn't responding. That's the one that we created. You can see it hasn't been assigned to any of the employees yet because it was just submitted. And you can see the status is open ticket. But what I was trying to tell you guys is now that we created this link ticket details, you will see in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen, TID equals and then the ticket ID that belongs to this specific ticket. So when I click on that link, we pass the ticket ID in the URL. Oh, sorry, I think I need to check my uh, destination. I might need to include the full URL. I don't wanna have to worry about it. So let me copy this, sorry, sorry, let me copy this URL that I have up here in the browser. Copy that, let's go back to data pages. Uh, my tickets, let's go back to that HTML block really quickly. And then in the source, we're just gonna include the full URL to the page so that we don't get disconnected. And this is called ticket details, ticket underscore details dot HTML. So I'm just including the entire URL of my web page. Okay, ticket details. So we don't have a relative path here. Let's hit finish. Let's try that one more time. So I'm just going to reload. Click on the ticket details. And you can see we need to deploy three additional data pages on the details page. And I pass the ticket ID inside the URL. All right, so now let's build those three data pages. The ticket details, the response form, and the responses. So a new data page. By the way, we have nine data pages to build. So we still have seven more to create, okay? So we're gonna create ticket details, hit next. Based off of the tickets table, let's call this ticket details. Style can be blue, localization can be English, restrict access to our customer, hit next. Filter data based on a predefined criteria. So now I need to be able to see the ticket details based on a filter. And the filter is going to be the ID that we passed in the URL, the ticket ID. Okay, we're gonna hit next. So that needs to be my field that we're going to filter our ticket details. So we include that in the filter as the filtering field. Hit next. And now we need to receive the ID. Okay, so we go into the advanced tab. We receive the value externally. External parameter is the one that you pass in the URL. That's considered external parameter. And the parameter name is going to be TID, which stands for ticket ID, and value must be required. The reason why value has to be required, in order for me to be able to view the ticket details, this value that we pass in the URL must be passed. It's, it's a required field. That's the only way for me to be able to see the ticket details. And then what information now do we want to display it in the details? So let's take a look and see what I have. Uh, date created can be the first field. So we have date created, okay. We have ticket number, so that's the ticket ID. 
we have assigned category. So that's employee ID category. Um, title description attachment. So we have title description attachment. And I think we have status as the last one. Yeah. So we'll include the status field. All right. So we have date created. We have ticket ID. We have employee ID category ticket title description attachment for attachment you can actually hide this field if it's blank so if you don't submit any attachment in the original submission there's really no reason for you to have an empty field here so you could hide that field which i didn't do in my live example but you could hide that field so it's a little bit cleaner looking if you don't have an attachment and I think that's all I need. Let's not navigate to the next one and let's just hit finish and let's deploy this data page. Grab our embed code back into our HTML file. And for ticket details, here's data page number one. We're going to paste that, save. Let's publish it. So reload. Ticket details. Yes. And we should now be able to see the ticket details. So I passed the ID to this page. And the reason why I'm able to see the ticket details is because I'm receiving this ticket ID in the URL and my data page is simply filtering the information based on that ID. Okay. Now let's build a form to submit the response. So a new data page, and I'll just go to my live example here for a second. Okay. Submission form. We're going to hit next based off of the responses table. So we're going to call this submit a response. Again, I'll use the same blue style, same localization of English, restrict access to customer, hit next. And let's see what information do we need to have in the form? Uh, at this point, I need all of my fields in the form. So let's move them all to the right. Hit next. The ticket ID. Remember what I said? When you pass that ticket ID to the details page, all three of those data pages need to be able to receive that ticket ID. That's why my submission form, I'm also going to receive the ticket ID in the advanced tab. So we're going to say receive value externally as TID. Okay. And the reason why this form needs to receive the ticket ID is because in the responses table, we need to stamp the ticket ID so that we know which responses belong to what ticket. It's a one to many. Okay. And all you need to do here is simply just hide that field to make it hidden. The user ID, we're going to stamp that using a different method. So for the user ID, we're going to hide that field. And using the authentication method, we can stamp the customer ID so that we know which customer is submitting the response. OK. And then we have the response itself. That's going to be a text area, probably going to be a required field. You have the attachment, could be an optional field. Date submitted is going to be a timestamp. OK, hit next. And then all we're going to do is have the form reload. No need to see a confirmation message because every time I submit a response, I just need the form to reload. Okay, so the form, there's no confirmation message. I can continue submitting responses, but I'm able to see my responses underneath. All right, let's hit finish to save. And let's deploy that, grab that embed code, copy back into my HTML file, paste. And let's publish. Reload. The details. Come back. Refresh. And there's my form. It looks like it's connected to my details page up above, but it's actually two separate data pages. Let me just add a header here so it's a little bit cleaner looking. I don't want you guys to think that it's a submission form because it's not. Uh, it is a submission form, but only the, the text area in this field are submission part of the submission form, not the information you see up, up above. So we're going to just create a simple heading here. So let's just do uh, HTML block and we'll just do um, submit a response, highlight bold and make it a little bit bigger here so it stands out. OK, finish. Okay. You can do the same thing for the details page if you like. So if I come back to my ticket details and we just simply add an HTML block, we'll say uh, ticket 
Get your details, highlight, bold, and a little bit bigger. Finish, reload. Okay. So now we have a separation between our ticket details and the submitted response. The last data page we need to create is for us to be able to see the responses directly underneath. So let's create that data page. Let me just take a look at my live example. We have the comment and we have dates submitted. So we're going to build a brand new data page. And am I using a tabular? No, I'm using a list layout. List layout is good if you have long text. I've said this before. Uh, if the results page is going to have a paragraph or long text, I don't recommend a tabular report because tabular is usually good for summary of your data. If you have a one word or two word answer, it's a little bit easier to see in that data cell. But if you have long text, it's much easier to read long text uh, using a list data page. So this is based off of the responses table. Let's call this view responses. And this is the final data page we're going to create for the customer. Uh, we're going to filter the data. Uh, do I need RLS? I don't really need RLS, but I'm going to enable it anyway, even though you don't need to. Just in case somebody shares the URL with a ticket ID, um, not that it's ever going to happen because you still have to log into the application, but if you want an additional security measure, you can put customer ID. Um, no, actually, I take that back. I'm sorry, you don't need RLS here because you also need to be able to see um, the responses from the employee, not just your own responses. So I take that back. Let's hit next. The only thing we need here is to filter out the responses based on the ticket ID. So include a ticket ID as your filtering field. And in the advanced tab, receive the value externally. And then we call that parameter TID, value required. Hit next. And then we want the comments and we want the date submitted. and if you have an attachment, yeah, you should be able to download the attachment as well. So let's hit next. Uh, next, the response, date submitted, attachment. Again, for the attachment, you can hide that field if it's blank. If you don't have an attachment, there's no reason to show that label. Hit next. Let's see the latest response first. Hit next. No need for details page and just click finish and we're done. Enable. Copy back to my final data page on that ticket details page. So you can see I have three data pages embedded into a single web page called ticket details. So what ends up happening here is when you're looking at all of your tickets, so this is the report that shows me all the tickets. And this is the report that has that link ticket details. So when you click on that link from this data page called ticket details, the website redirects me to this page. I'm passing the ticket ID from this page to this page. And then here we have three data pages that are receiving that ticket ID. So let's test this out. We're going to move that page back into our sum app account, replace and refresh. So we should be, we should be able to not see any responses here because we haven't submitted a response yet for this specific ticket. But going from the start, if I go back to my all tickets and if I go to ticket details, you can see it's an open ticket. Click on that link. No employee has taken on my ticket yet to handle it and I have not received any responses. So maybe as a customer, I can say, hello, is anyone there working today? I need an answer ASAP and hit submit. All right. So now I can also remove this filtering option that you see up here to sort. Um, but now you can see the customer is, you know, he or she is worried, you know, I need a response. This is an urgent matter for me. Can somebody give me a response? Now let's work on the employee side of things. Okay, so we have all of our customer data pages, which we can move into a folder. So let me create a folder called customers. And let's just quickly move all of these data pages inside the customer folder. So we clean this up a little bit, move inside. Let me find my app. There's my customer folder and move all those data pages. So next time, if you're logging in, you need to you need to modify your customer data pages. You can find them all nicely grouped inside a customer folder. All right, let's build all of our employee data pages. So new data page. Uh, we're going to build and let's let me actually pull up my live example for the employees now. 
So the employees can see all the tickets. All right. And we have an additional search field. So let's create that data page. Now, one thing that I recommend uh, to everyone, you don't have to build a data page from scratch again. If you have a data page that closely resembles the one that you need to create, which in this case is my, my tickets data page, you can see this data page looks almost identical to this one with the exception of one additional search field. And we have maybe one or two more columns listed here in the results page. You can compare the two side by side. I can make a copy of that data page and just modify it. Okay, so come over here and just make a copy of it by clicking on duplicate. And let's just call that underscore one for now and hit save. Okay, I'm also going to create a folder for my employees. Like that. And I'm just going to move my copied data page by clicking on more and clicking on move and moving it inside my employee folder. Okay, and now I can rename it just to remove that underscore one. I wasn't able to rename it before because you can't have the same data page names inside uh, the same folder. So the name will have to be different. And now I just need to edit my data page. It's still going to preserve a lot of the functionality that the other data page had because I just made a copy of it, but I do need to make a few modifications to it. For example, the authentication now needs to be the employee sign in because the employees are going to log in and have additional functionality compared to the customers. Okay. All of everything else is still the same. We're going to hit next. Um, as for record level security, no need for RLS. When the employees log in, they need to be able to see all the tickets listed. Okay. All the tickets listed so they can go and assign those tickets to themselves. Okay. So whoever is feeling the most motivated that, that day of your employees, they can log in and they can assign all of those tickets to themselves if they wanted to, if they want to be the star of, of the month or something like that, or if you have an incentive or a competition going on internally. So no need for RLS here. Uh, let's hit next. And let me take a look at my search field. So we have ticket number, ticket title, status, and assigned to. So right over here, we can see who the tickets are assigned to. So come over here and just include employee ID field into your search form. And now we just need to move that field side by side. Okay, we're going to put the label on top. And then for, uh, for employee ID, it's already connected for me. The dropdown is already connected for me. But what I like to do is I like to include both custom values and lookup table because under custom values, I want to be able to say um, any employee. In, in other words, uh, show me all of the employees that the tickets are assigned to. And then I can connect to my employee table, display the full name, and it's still the ID behind the scenes when you're searching for the employee. Okay, I think that's all I need to do here. Let's continue. And then on the results page, what do we have? Uh, we still have ticket details. Uh, we have inline edit, we have inline delete. And when I click on edit, the only things I can do are change the status. The reason why you see new open and close is because I made some modifications to my application and I initially had new and I decided to go with open and closed. That's why you still see new. So that's my mistake. And then for assign to, I can reassign that ticket to another employee. If let's say I'm feeling overwhelmed and I can't take all of these tickets, I got overzealous thinking I was going to be able to, but I want to reassign that ticket now to somebody else. So we have next and we have inline edit. We have inline delete. Okay, because I feel like as an employee, maybe I have the ability to delete these tickets, or maybe that should be an admin level user who has that capability or that permission. All right, for ticket ID, ticket title under editing, I don't need to be able to edit the ticket title. I don't want to edit date created. Category, maybe you can edit the category. I'll leave that up to you. I'm just going to disable that. Now for status, yes, I would like to be able to edit the status using inline edit. So here I'm going to create a dropdown and I'm just going to look up a table here and select my status field that I have. And that's going to list me open or closed. Those two statuses that we have in our lookup table. And then for employee ID, same thing, dropdown, we have employee full name, perfect. 
Now, some of you may be wondering, how come you don't do both here as well? There's no reason for both here because the ticket is already going to be assigned to us. It's already going to have an empty value in the dropdown. So there's really no need to say something inside that dropdown. And then finally, HTML block. If you look at my web pages, I have another ticket details for the employees. I just call it E underscore ticket details. Just a different name compared to this one here. This one is for the customer and this one is going to be for the employee. So we just have to rename to E underscore ticket details because it's a different web page that the employees will see. Hit next. This is all the same. No details and click finish and let's test this out. Copy our embed code. And E all tickets for employees. So this is the employee web page where they go to be able to see all the tickets. Okay. So let's push that live. So win SCP, reload, E all tickets. And I will need to open up a new tab up here. E underscore all tickets. And let's log in as John Doe, who happens to be my sample user, employee.com, password test. Login in, and here we have it. Okay. So if you guys recall, we submitted this ticket. My Outlook isn't responding. As John, I'm one of the employees. Okay, I can filter out the tickets that were that I took on that I assigned to myself or another employee. Um, I can go to inline edit now. And if I feel like I want to take on this ticket, I can just assign this to myself, hit update, and now that ticket is assigned to me. Okay, and other employees can see that it's already being handled by somebody else. Um, I can reassign that ticket to another employee if I had another employee in my employee's table. I don't, so I can't really reassign it to anyone else. If I feel like this ticket needs to be closed, I can close that ticket at any time. Okay, and now under details, which should take me to e-ticket details. So when I click on this link, I now need to build three more data pages for the employees. Okay. But if you guys remember what I just said, you don't need to build these data pages from scratch. You can just make copies of the existing ones that you have. So we can do this much faster if I just simply open up my customer folder, make a copy of that, save it. Let's move it first to my employee folder. Okay, I'm just going to rename it. And this one is actually very similar to the one that we had before. So if I come back here to look at my live example, and if we go to ticket details, the difference here is I can edit the assign to field and I can also edit the status. So let's come back to data pages, edit. Make sure you select your employee authentication. Very important because this data page belongs to the employee, not the customer. Okay, so this is all good. Uh, we are once again receiving the ticket ID. Uh, that's good. That's good. And the employee ID now, we know it's, a, it's an editable field, so we can just turn this into a dropdown and select the employee table. That's perfect. And for status, we can turn this into a dropdown as well and change the status from open to closed if needed. Where is my status lookup table? Perfect. And that's it. Let's hit finish to save. Deploy. Copy. E-ticket details and replace data page number one. And we have two more data pages and we're done with today's live stream. All right, let's save and publish. So reload, e-ticket details, replace, come back here, refresh, and now I should be able to see that ticket. So now from the details page directly, I can also reassign this ticket to a different employee as John Doe. And if I, let's say I found a solution to the problem, I can close that ticket as the employee. And I, again, I don't have a lot of um, automation built in here, but you could also, if let's say I close that ticket, I could notify the customer via email immediately, let them know, hey, um, John found a solution to your problem. Either provide the solution in the body of the email, because you could do that. You can add the resolution as a parameter inside the body of the email, or you can provide a message that says, log into your account to see uh, how this ticket was resolved. So the customer will now log in and see the response from the, um, from the employee.
Okay, but you could have those emails going back and forth behind the scenes. But I, again, we don't have that kind of time to build all of that in the live streams. So now we need the response form. So let's just make a copy of this one. Here is my submit a response. Copy it. And same as before, we'll just move it. And just to clean this up, we're going to rename it. I think I saw somebody submit a comment. Uh, is this the same ticketing system that your support staff uses at Caspio? Not exactly. That ticketing system is a little bit more robust. It has um, some more dynamic functionality built in. Um, for example, we have pop-up forms to submit a ticket. Um, if my memory serves me well, we have a pop-up form. As opposed to my application that I created today, you can see how the customer has to click on this link to go to that form. In our portal, we have a button up here that says new ticket. And then when you click that button, it has a pop-up form that shows up to submit the ticket. So it's a bit more dynamic. What else do we have that's different? I think the responses are handled a little bit differently. We have the initials. I'm trying to remember what else is in there. There's a little bit of SQL as well on the results page that on the results page that shows. So here on the results page, we have an SQL column that displays who was the last person to respond to the ticket, what date and time that ticket received the response so that the user doesn't have to go to ticket details in order to see that information. And I think we're using some emojis <laughs> to gamify the application using two circles. If it's closed, it's red. If it's open, it's green. I covered this in my previous live streams. If you look at Unicode emojis, Caspio and YouTube, you'll be able to find a stream. It's a really good session. If you want to spurs up the application to make it look a little more eye appealing to your end user, you could add some little emojis here and there to make the application look pretty, if you will. Okay. Yeah, no worries. So where was I? I think I lost my train of thought here. Okay, so we need the response form. Okay, so we made a copy of it. So let's edit. Hit next. Use the employee authentication. Hit next. I hit next. User ID. Yeah, it's a hidden field, authentication field, and now I select the employee ID from the dropdown. That's right. So when the employee responds, obviously we want to stamp the employee's ID in the responses table, not the customer ID, because now I'm logged in as the employee. Uh, ticket ID is still the same. This is going to be my heading response. All of this is good. Hit next, same form, hit finish, and we're done. And one last data page left, and we have managed to build all of this in time. And then we'll save a few more minutes for the directories feature here at the end. Close, open this up, ticket details, replace that, save, and uh, win SCP. Fresh. Move it to the right, override, and reload. Okay, and now let's create our final data page to be able to see the responses submitted by the customer as the employee. Uh, let me take a look at this comment here that came in from Taylor. So whenever you're using functional icon icons or emojis, it is critical that you provide an accessible name alternative for non-sighted. Yeah, so it is important to do that. Um, I forgot what the compliance is for that. I think it's like 501 government compliance. Uh, they have these browsers that can read um, these images. But yeah, alt in the code, you could use alt. And then when you hover over it, tells you what that image is, if the image is not displayed or if they're not able to see the image. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that's important. Okay. Good feedback there. And the final data page, right? So let's come over here and copy the responses that we had before. You can see I'm not building everything from scratch. All I do is just make copies to save on time. It's much quicker and much easier, much more efficient to do it that way. So let's move this to our employee folder. And just like that, we're able to build a very simple solution and a simple support system, ticketing management system for businesses. If they need to use something very simple, customers can log in, 
submit tickets, and then you have employees in the back end who can log in as well and be able to manage those tickets. So let's edit. Now, could I make this much more sophisticated? Absolutely. I can build an admin portal with dashboards, with charts. I can make this much more automated if I wanted to. Again, that would take a little bit more time. And because I have to explain things in my live stream, it takes a little bit longer to build these out because sometimes we'll have brand new customers attending the live stream. Sometimes we have existing customers who might find this a little tedious, uh, me having to explain everything. But, you know, we have to, we have to tailor these sessions for everyone, basically. Okay. Next. So we have the responses. That's going to be based on the employee login. Hit next. Filter the responses based on the ticket ID. That's perfect. Uh, okay. That's same, 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 same. Um, remember how I had that sort drop down? I'm not going to do interactive sorting. No details. Click finish. And we are officially done. Embed. Copy and replace, save, and let's push it live. E-ticket details. And let's see that submission from, um, I think it was Sarah Smith who said that her, um, well, she was complaining, not complaining, but she was saying that she needs to get a response. She said, hello, anyone working today or something like that? Let's see her response. Okay, I need an answer ASF. So now is John Doe, now that I took on that, Take it, I can respond to Sarah and say, uh, hi, Sarah, sorry for the delay, delay. Um, what was the name of the, okay, my, oh, please try reloading your Outlook and let us know if that fixes your issue. Hit submit. And now upon my submission, I can send an email to Sarah to notify her, hey, there's a response in your portal, log in. But again, we don't have that kind of, kind of time to build all of that in these live streams. Maybe what I could do, because I build the content out for the live stream, you can see I have a live example, right? Maybe what I could do is make that part of, make, make it enabled on my live example in the actual demo that I give. So it's a more complete solution that you download that includes the email notifications as well in the future, but on our, in our live stream, when we build out the application, I can strip it to not include that because we don't have the time. So at least you have the email capability behind the scenes and you can see how it all comes together. But yeah, this is it. Um, this is the entire application. So we finished everything. We have all the tickets that we can manage as the employees. Uh, here's my actual live example. So we have all the tickets that we can manage as the employees. Uh, and then we have the customer portal where they can submit a new ticket and they can view all the tickets that they have submitted. And now they can also see who is handling their ticket. And in the details, so my Outlook isn't responding. Now as Sarah Smith, I can see the response from the employee. Okay. Let me know if you found today's live stream helpful and useful. Hopefully you learned something new. The goal is for you guys to always learn something new from these live streams. Uh, I hope that I was able to accomplish that. Uh, if not, if you've seen all of this before, that's okay as well. Um, it's always good to get a refresher on some of the things that you may have seen before. Uh, let's see, if you wanted to enable formatting for comments, WYSIWYG, rich text editor, is there a way to restrict which formatting options are available to the user? Not without some customization. So when you're enabling the comments, so let me see if you want to enable formatting for comments. Uh, you could enable rich text. I'm sure you're aware of that. So if you, let me see, which one am I looking at? This is for the customer. So let's edit that data page on the customer side. Submit a response. So when you're editing the text area, you've seen this in the advanced tab. You can enable rich text editing toolbar from simple standard to the advanced, but there's no way to limit what those options are based on the user that's logged in or based on their permission level without I don't even know how you would go about actually customizing that to limit um, which options are available to the end user. If I choose simple, you have a very simple toolbar um, that the customer will see. Okay, so that's the simple toolbar. 
which gives you only a couple of options. But there is no way to limit, like let's say if I don't want them to be able to italicize their text, I can't just remove that. Uh, we, we might be able to get the external code and then somehow put that in my footer and then with the code we might be able to, but again, that would remove the it italic for everyone, not based on just a single user, if you want to limit by user. Um, unless we somehow in the script include the user. Oh. Let me give that some thought. Yeah, I still think the options are more than enough, like you said. Because um, this is pretty limited, you know, in terms of what you can do. And then if you flip that to the advanced, you will see you get so many more options uh, under response here. So you can do advanced. And then when you reload, um, that might be an overkill <laughs> for what they might need to do in that response. But it's still pretty fun to, you know, for them to be able to. I can see this being useful if you're creating like a, a job listing and you want to do bullet points or bullets in front like that. Like if you're listing your, your qualifications or something like that. All right, let me know if there are any additional questions based on what we've seen here today. Uh, thank you, Taylor, for the feedback and the comments. And then I will give you a quick overview of the directories feature, which is brand new in Caspio. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, the videos are always going to be available, so you can rewatch them at your own pace if you need to. Thanks, Ginkapo. Hopefully they can uh, benefit from this ticket management system in your organization as well. Just imagine if you're, uh, if you're managing a team of salespeople, you know, and they have, want to submit a ticket regarding Salesforce or something like that, and you happen to be the admin, and they have issues with the back end somehow, automation, revenue, they can submit these tickets and then you as the admin, you can respond to them. Instead of email, right? You don't want to go back and forth via email. That might just be, um, that might be too much and really hard from the organization perspective uh, to know where everything is. Yeah, it can be modified. Yeah, this is just a simple, like the categories that I have when you submit a new ticket, these are my categories, but you can flip this to be for a project management type tool or sales or some other way um, based on the, the business requirements. Yeah, very cumbersome, you're right. Okay. So I'm sure many of you have seen the directories feature inside your account. This is brand new. Um, I know it's only available right now at the moment. It's available in certain plans. Don't quote me on this, but Little Birdie told me that this is at some point going to become available across uh, more accounts. Um, so we'll see. Okay, but for now, what it is, it's our built-in, our own IDP built into Caspio uh, that allows you to manage all of your users. Um, we call them directories, but a directory essentially is a table. Okay, that's what a directory is. And inside that directory, you have your users and it's handled the same exact way as today. So if your application has customers and employees like we have today in our example, then you will need to create two different directories, just like what I have here. Okay. So let me show you from maybe um, building a brand new application very quickly from this perspective. So let's just say one demo directories or something like this. So it's at the very top up here. So you create your app and you know that your app is going to need to have um, customers and employees. So you'll go to directories. You'll create a directory and I'll just use DD for demo directory and then DIR for directory and then we'll call this customers. Now you can convert an existing table. So if you have existing applications that have user tables, you can convert those user tables into directories. So I'm just going to hit create. So from here now you can add your users inside that directory. So you no longer have a need for you know, building a table inside your application. All of it will be managed here from this view. So I can add a user to my directory. 
we have some optional fields here and you can add the user via the email inside the directory okay for your customers one thing that i will point out here is today uh, there is really no way to do SAS type with the directories so if you have a public facing registration form it will still the information will still go into your directory but the problem will be with activating the user if you know now when it comes to registration usually you have a hidden field to make that user active by default so they can log into the application right away so this um, this checkbox here is not connected to your table unfortunately but in the upcoming releases we are going to provide the capability for SAS as well so it ties into your directory if you have a public facing registration form if you plan on using directories today then I only recommend that you use them for internal applications only nothing to do with the public facing registration form because today it's a bit of a limitation okay so let's say you have a customer and your customer name is John Doe at customer.com his first name is John uh, his last name is Doe. Signing method right now, it's going to be Caspia, but you'll notice here that we can now include IDPs here as well. So if you're using Okta, if you're using Microsoft Active Directory, you can choose a different sign in method. But for now, we're going to use Caspia and you can activate the user if you'd like. And now it's all automated. You have two ways to activate that user you can generate the password on their behalf. And if you do that, you can ask them to change their password on the first login. So first time they, when they first log into the application, they have to change the password to something else. Or you can send an email with the activation link. So there's no more workarounds for that. So now if I add this user, if I add their email, they'll check their email, they'll get an email, they have to click on the link, and now they can log into the application. So the email has to be valid. Uh, another drawback to directories today is directories cannot handle cannot handle roles today and that still has to be done the same exact way as before so in your table you will have a role field you will define if it's an admin supervisor manager you still have to use the view to filter out um, based on the the role field so it's still the same but in the upcoming updates we are going to make it available for users to have roles inside the directories so you don't have to worry about the field in your table okay uh, don't worry about groups for now groups are going to be used when permissions become available and roles it's going to be much more beneficial for now don't worry about groups we're going to hit create and we should be able to see john doe listed here unless i didn't do something correctly here Did I not hit? What did I? What did I hit? Did I hit create? I thought I did. Um, I've mentioned this before. <laughs> Sorry about the delay here. It looks like I'm having some technical difficulties. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Am I still live? I hope that I am. Uh, my account, unfortunately, is on a server that has a lot more employee accounts so from time to time there might be some delays let me do a control f5 here uh, i was hoping to show this to you today but as you can see these things tend to happen when you have a live demo and i think it's just it's overtime yeah by 10 minutes you guys are welcome to go uh, you can watch this later on if you'd like, and I am I am also going to be re uh, releasing a video, a standalone video, just on directories in a few days, which will be available on our YouTube channel too. But this is just as an add-on for those who have the time, want to stick around and see what this is about. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to show this to you. But as you can see, um, yeah, uh, I'm not able to. Give you a good demonstration of the directories because for some reason things are still loading yeah sorry about this looks like we are having be great if you can import users via csv file and automatically trigger the registration emails to them yeah that will be i'm pretty sure we're going to make that available at some point especially if you import your users to your table from csv and then you convert your table to a directory 
I think it's not a direct import from CSV to directories, but if you create a table, then you can create that table into a directory. But I will just mention under security here, a um, couple of things which have been added to the directories, which are very useful. We now have two-factor authentication on the app level. Okay, we didn't have that before. So that's new with directories and security policy on the password. You can see um, we now have failed sign-in attempts. So if you fail to log in three times with that password, it's going to deactivate your account. You can change that to something else if you'd like. Typically, we see this when we log into our bank account um, for security. We've had this before, minimum password strength. That's, we've had that before. And then number of previous passwords restricted from use. So if you have, let's say, set this to five and you use five different passwords, you're not going to be able to use those passwords. And then enforce password expiration. That's also new. So if you set this to, let's say, maybe 80, um, after 80 days, you have to change the password to something else. Okay. And let's cancel that. So that's also new. App connections, you can now connect um, to maybe Salesforce, to Slack, uh, to, um, to um, Bamboo HR, if your company is using Bamboo HR, uh, to submit information there as well. Uh, let me think. Under user portal, uh, when you're logging into the application, you have some branding options now. So when you click edit, you can change the logo and the log a login screen. You can change the display name. And in the footer of the login page, you can edit that as well and include some helpful links underneath. If you have a terms of service, if you have a privacy policy, uh, contact support. Uh, let's see what else. And then you're provided this link to the, direct to the directory. So if I click on this, let's say you're logged into the directory. My recommendation in your application is to take this link and make it part of your navigation menu because this is really going to be your account profile, if you will. This is where you're going to be able to change your password and where you're also going to be able to log out of the directory. One thing to mention here is if you have a Caspio logout link on your website, and most of us know that's located in the authentications object. You grab the logout link and you make that available as part of your website to log out, right? Today, that logout link does not sync with the directory. So it's two separate logouts. But in the upcoming release, it's going to be synced. So if you log out of the Caspio application, it's simultaneously going to log you out of the Caspio directory as well. Okay, so today it's one way or the other. All right, so it's not synced up. Okay, so that's important to note. Okay. And let me go back and see. Maybe I can show you this. Maybe this, let me try this one. Okay, here we go. So email, good, John Doe at customer.com. Uh, I'm not going to add the optional fields. Caspio, activate user. I, I have to use generate password because uh, this email is, our, um, is fictitious. It's not really going to go to anyone. So generate password. You can uh, show the password if you'd like. Uh, I'm just going to copy that and hit Oh, I'm not able to hit create. Why? 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 I have that. I have that. Okay, interesting. It's not letting me add the user. How about just john at customer.com? Send email, but when I click on generate password, why, 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 why is it not letting me? I didn't have these issues before when I was testing the features, so I am wondering why. It's not letting me select this option. But anyway, I'm just going to show you. Let's send an email. It's not really going to go to anyone. I'm going to hit create. Save. It should show me that user now listed here, hopefully. User created. There we go. And pending user activation. So now this user, John, has to check the email, click on the activation link, and he's going to be an active user inside the customer directory. So here's one thing which, which is going to be available in the upcoming release is when you create the user, 
or directory, you're going to be able to specify what application you want that directory to go into. Now what you need to do is if I want to link that directory to my application, I have to go to all assets, go to tables, find that directory. So DD underscore, I think is what we call it. So here it is. You're going to click more, you're going to click share, and then you're going to share it with that application and click on this button. And now when you go inside that application, you're going to be able to go to your tables and find that directory. Okay. One really interesting thing here, which is helpful, is if you click on design, you're going to be able to see the default fields provided by the directory. But if I come over here now, if I add a field, let's say role, phone number, and click save, I'm saving those fields to my directory. So if I go back to directories, and if we edit, or open. And if I add a new user to this directory, and if I expand my optional fields, you're going to be able to see how we carry those fields from that table, which is essentially the directory. And now it's available here for me. So if I add a new user to my customers table, or my customers directory, I now have the option to submit those fields as well. But as I said before, um, in the future, when you're creating the directory, so let's say we create a new one, you're going to have the option to select what application you want that directory, directory to be a part of. Today, you'll have to go to All Assets, find it, and if you want to share it with your application, you have to click on the Share link and move that directory into your app. And from there, you can manage everything. Um, so now for this specific one that I created, I could enable uh, two-factor authentication which uses, uh, in a lot of cases, it uses the Google Authenticator. You'll see a little QR code that you have to scan, and that's going to give you access, along with your email and password that you have to log in with. I'm sure many of us are familiar with that. You can enforce two-factor for all of your users, if you'd like, and hit Save. Okay. I'm not going to create anything. I did have a little demo here uh, that I set up for my video that shows... Oh, I deleted my data page. I'm sorry. Um, I had a live uh, demo working uh, a couple days ago, but I deleted it since then. But the idea now here is to go to a directory login, and you can log into the application to see the form or any other data page that you create using either two-factor authentication. You no longer have to worry about the data page to reset password. That's all part of the directory. So that's built in here. Okay, so that's another benefit to using the directory, along with a security, with two-factor, and then password security. Um, and it's just a nice one single source where you can go to to manage all of your customers. So if I open up John's information here, I can now choose to suspend this account so he no longer can log into the application. Or I can activate his account here once again, I can send an email or I can generate the password on his behalf or I can suspend his account and he won't be able to log in. So I'll just mention when you're building your user table, you still have to include the role field, same as before. Um, you don't need to worry about the checkbox to make users active or inactive. So now in the view, you're really just filtering on the role field. You don't have to worry about active or inactive anymore. That's part of the directory. Okay. Um, uh, you cannot do SAS today, but that's coming. All right. So don't forget that. And one other thing, uh, which I think is somewhat critical, is when you're creating a new directory and you're converting your existing table. And let's say we have a table of docs. You have to map out your fields with your existing table. So we have the email field. We're going to create a new user ID. First name to first. I only have the name field in that table, unfortunately. So we're going to create a new field. And password, we have the password field. Okay, one thing to point out here, which is very important. Let's say that in your user table, in this case, my doctor's table, you have some doctors who are active and some doctors who are inactive. Be very careful with this because today, when you're converting your existing table, you can do one or the other. You can either make all of your doctors inactive or you can make all of your doctors active. So it's one way or the other. Okay, so if you had some inactive doctors in your existing table, they're going to be active once again. And you have to manually, in your directory, suspend those inactive doctors. 
okay? Very careful. We don't have a way to automatically detect who's active and who's not active. But in the upcoming releases, we're going to have that capability as well. In addition, so I recommend if you're going to convert your existing table into a directory, set up your table and then convert it into a directory. Because it would be very difficult to go through each one of your users and make them now individually active or inactive. Okay. In addition, if you convert your existing table, be very, very careful because there is no way to revert back to your original table. Okay. So be careful with that. It's not listed here. There's no warning or anything like that, but there's no way to revert back and undo what you just did. You could, you could, but you're going to have to delete some data pages that are tied and linked to your other related objects in your application. Okay, so I'm just letting you know now so you don't make the same mistake that I did with one of my demo applications that I had. So just giving you a heads up on that. But once we're able to detect who's active and who's not active in the user table, which will make, which will be available in the upcoming release and the addition to revert back to the original table will be available as well in the updates, in the upcoming updates. For now, just a warning here, be careful with it. Okay. So myself, I personally love the feature, especially because of all the security around it. Um, but if I'm building a SaaS application, I would hold off on using directories. If I'm building an internal application, I will definitely take advantage of it. Um, and I would still set up my roles the way we used to with the uh, admins, managers, supervisors, same way as before. You just, uh, when, you, when it comes to setting up your authentication, you link to a directory as opposed to your view or your table. Okay. All right. I've taken enough of your time. For today's live stream thank you so much for sticking around if you have any last minute questions here let me know before we um, depart but i'm happy to answer any other questions you might have with anything that we covered today directories if you have any questions or the um, ticket management system okay that's why you see it's still in beta okay because we are going to definitely be improving that feature. We really want to get away from using the traditional way of setting up the user table, right? With the views and the authentications, we want to be able to manage all of that to simplify it inside the directories. It's gonna make life a lot easier uh, from the building perspective because you're gonna have all the same capabilities, right? Without you having to worry about, oh, I want to activate my user or, you know, like the password security, two-factor authentication, or SAS. All of that is going to be all in one place, easily manageable. Uh, so we don't have to go to too many objects to do all of that. Thanks, Kinkapo. Good to see you. Thanks for uh, coming back to these live sessions. I do appreciate that. Uh, David, you as well. Uh, no code to low code or low code to no code. Preferably low code to no code. <laughs> All right. So we will end the session. I will keep the comments open for another minute or two. I will just close my view. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to like the video uh, before you go um, so that we can get more exposure on Caspio and help other people who are looking to build uh, no code solutions out there. Taylor, thank you so much. I hope to see you next week as well. I don't have the title available yet for next week, uh, but if you guys think of something, you'd like to see something in these live streams, I am more than happy to take on your suggestions. We can definitely include them. So I will just provide my email and just email me if you have a suggestion for something that you would like to see in the live stream. And if I think it's worthwhile if I think it's feasible and easy enough to do and it's not going to deviate too much from no code, we will definitely incorporate that into our future live stream. Okay. For those of you who are new to Caspio, uh, I just gonna end with saying that Caspio, first and foremost, it's a no code platform. You can accomplish many things using no code, just like what we did today in our live stream. But we also don't want to limit imagination, so we do allow you to inject industry standard languages such as HTML, CSS, JavaScript, SQL, 
to further manipulate and customize the look and feel of your application. So even if you're a no coder, you can build your application uh, plus or minus the dynamic functionality minus the dynamic functionality. But if you have some development knowledge, if you if you you know if your technical acumen is better than than no coders, if you if you know JavaScript or SQL, you can really take your applications to the next level. Okay. All right. Once again, thank you so much. Good to see many of you. I will close the live stream, but I'll keep the chat running for another minute if there are any last minute questions. Thank you so much. Have a good week and I'll see you on Monday.